ahead and turn this over now to Maria and Ksenia and get started. Maria, you should have control. All right, thank you, Amy. And welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning to learn a little bit more about how to understand and use nonprofit financial statements. This session is part of our board best practices nonprofit webinar series, and we are excited to have all of you here with us today. We know that every nonprofit has a unique mix of financial characteristics, but not all financials or not all nonprofits are created equal. And we also understand that joining us today, we likely have experienced CPAs and CFO level individuals who have a very clear understanding of nonprofit financial statement terminology. But we also know that we have nonprofit board members joining us, board members who may or may not be used to reading and reviewing nonprofit financial statements. So for those of you that are more experienced, bear with us. We will spend some time talking through key areas of financial reporting that are specific to nonprofits and what are some of those areas uh, and key considerations to be thinking about when it comes to those items. Um, from there, we will move into how you can utilize this understanding to make informed and strategic decisions and providing your donors or biggest supporters with the most compelling story. It also is important to know that the ability to achieve long-term mission fulfillment and financial sustainability does depend on having board members and staff who are engaged, who support your mission and who understand their role when it comes to financial reporting and key performance indicators. So before we move forward, I wanted to take a minute to introduce myself and my co-presenter. My name is Maria Schwingler and I'm an audit partner with I Bailey based out of our Minneapolis office. I've been with the firm for almost 16 years and have focused my time within our nonprofit industry practice for that entire time. I also have a focus in the area of audits of employee benefit plans. And joining me today is Ksenia Popke. Ksenia is an audit partner with I Bailey based out of our Denver office. And Ksenia has been with I Bailey for over or close to 10 years and has extensive knowledge working with nonprofits in the education, cultural and performing arts, health and human services, and public and private foundations. Um, Kenya, Ksenia is also a current member of the AICPA's Not for Profit Advisory Council. And both Ksenia and I have served on nonprofit boards. So as we share information with you over the next hour or so, you know, our goal is to touch on the following learning objectives. As I mentioned, we will identify those unique areas of nonprofit financial reporting. As we talk through those items, we'll also touch on key metrics and performance indicators, both financial and non-financial, that you should be thinking about as it relates to each of these areas. We'll also spend some time sharing ideas of how you can utilize these financials as a tool within your organization. Um, and as I said previously, to help tell the story of your organization to, to your donors, to your stakeholders, readers of your financial statements. So we wanted to start out by talking through some of those unique terminology items that you'll see uh, within nonprofit financial statements. The first being to clarify that the balance sheet and income statement of a nonprofit organization are referred to as a statement of financial position and a statement of activities. The statement of financial position is presenting information as of a point in time, you know, as of year end, as of month end, and your statement of activities encompasses activities uh, of the organization over a period of time. So for the year ended or for the month end. In a, a for-profit entity, you're likely used to hearing the word equity. For a nonprofit, this is referred to as net assets. Um, some of the other most common items uh, on a set of financial statements unique to nonprofits are this reference to donor-restricted net assets or net assets without a donor restriction. Uh, a lot of nonprofit organizations have larger investment portfolios and in many cases have established endowments where donors can provide a donation to the organization with the intent that the organization will hold that donation in perpetuity or forever and invest those dollars with the intent that they can spend the earnings on that gift, allowing the donor to provide a gift to the organization with a more long lasting effect. When it comes to revenue sources, you know, some of the most common revenue sources for nonprofits are contributions, program service fee revenue or fee for service revenue and membership revenue, 
Expenses are required to be categorized into three specific areas, both on the financial statements and on the Form 990. These categories include program service expenses, management in general, and fundraising expenses. And these allocations are oftentimes based on some aspect of an allocation estimate. So it's important for board members and management to understand what that allocation is and what story that may be telling an outside reader of the financial statements. And the last item on here is more so a clarification that nonprofit or not-for-profit doesn't mean you can't earn a profit. Uh, as we'll discuss in the coming slides, in all reality, you need to earn a profit or have a surplus. Um, and you may have years that you do not, but goals should be set most years with the anticipation to earn a profit because really that is the way in which your organization um, can grow and expand. Nonprofit really is a tax exempt status with the IRS. You are conducting your operations to accomplish a specific mission or purpose. And for that reason, the IRS has granted you tax exempt status. So we'll spend a little bit of time now talking through each of these unique areas in a little bit more detail and some key con and spend some time on key considerations that you might want to think about as you're looking at these items in your financial statements and maybe some trending over time. So the first area we'll touch on is that area of net assets. A real quick overview, in the last year or two, nonprofits were required to adopt a new accounting standard that changed the terminology related to donor restricted net assets and change and really changed the presentation of this within a set of nonprofit financials, going from a, a three class presentation down to two. Previously, those three classes were permanently restricted, which was most commonly referred to as a donor restricted endowment, temporarily restricted, those donor restricted dollars that are restricted for a specific time or purpose, and then unrestricted. There was a fair amount of confusion in practice for readers of financial statements to really understand what the difference between these three categories were. And so with this recent accounting standard change, we've now moved to just two net asset classifications, and that is with donor restrictions and without donor restrictions, so that a reader can easily identify what are those net assets that organizations have that truly are restricted by a donor. You're still required to disclose the nature and the amount of donor restrictions in your footnote disclosures. And in addition, if you have board designated net assets, which actually are considered to be net assets without a donor restriction, um, there needs to be more transparency in the financial statements on what those net assets are restricted for. The next few slides provide some high level e examples of what this presentation should look like. You know, this likely has a little bit more of an audited financial statement feel, but even if you have an organization that's not currently audited, I think it's information that you should be aware of and understand. So this provides an example of what the minimum presentation requirements are for net asset presentation on the statement of financial position. And then also an example of a more disaggregated presentation in either example, further disclosure of this information would be included in the footnotes. It's just in that disaggregated presentation, some organizations prefer to provide that additional detail right on the face of the statements for their readers. This provides you with an example of what that restricted net asset footnote disclosure would look like on the previous slide on that statement of financial position. The statement indicated there was 1,800,000 43,941 of net assets with donor restriction. And then this disclosure takes that number and provides a reader with more detail on what it is specifically restricted for. This is an example of how the net asset classification is commonly presented on the statement of activities. It provides a reader really a side-by-side -side presentation of revenues, expenses, and changes in net assets and overall totals. This first slide here shows the revenue pre presentation piece, and this is the remaining expenses and changes um, section of the statement of activities. And so you can see those net asset totals then tie back to the statement of financial position numbers presented. I know there's some organizations that may present this information a little bit differently in more of a horizontal presentation. Um, where you show the revenues without donor restrictions and then maybe show the restricted revenues underneath it. And either presentation is an acceptable presentation. 
And then last but not least, wanted to touch on board designated net assets again. As mentioned, these are considered to be net assets without a donor restriction. And if you have board designated net assets, there is a requirement to describe that restriction either on the face of this, the statement of financial position, which is the, the kind of upper example here, or detailed out within the footnote disclosures. Really at the end of the day, the reader should have an understanding of why the net assets are considered to be designated by the board. You know, what is the purpose of that designation? And as a recap, as it relates to net assets, you will want to understand what restricted net assets that you have and what are they restricted for? Do you have board designated net assets? And, and understanding these restrictions should help you better understand what truly is available to support the general operations of the organization. You know, when you look at trending in your net asset categories year over year, are you continuing to see deficits or declines in your net assets? And if, and if so, what's causing that? You know, and specifically when you look at net assets without donor restrictions, are you experiencing multiple years of net losses there? And, and what is the cause of that? The next area I will touch on is the area of investments um, and specifically endowments. Donor and board designated endowments are something that really are unique to the nonprofit area. For anyone unfamiliar with what an endowment is, it is a, a collection of cash and investment securities and possibly other items such as a historic building that are invested and managed by the organization with a goal of, of long-term growth. You know, donors provide gifts to nonprofits with the intent that the organization is going to hold that gift in perpetuity. So it really allows for the donor to give to the organization and have a longer lasting effect. Um, as an example, you know, I could give organization A $100,000 with the intent for it to be held uh, in perpetuity in the endowment. The organiza organization agrees to hold that $100,000 and create and maintain policies to really maintain that level of investment over time. But if that $100,000 earns $10,000 in investment earnings during the year, the organization can then appropriate that $10,000 from the endowment over to operations or some other specified program if designated by the donor. So nonprofits with endowments, you know, they're required to adhere to certain laws um, referred to often as a MIFA when maintaining and managing endowments. Within the footnotes to the financials, you are required to identify for a reader how much is restricted by donors and how much is restricted by the board because a lot of organizations do uh, put board restricted dollars into their endowment as well. You are also required to disclose the changes in the endowment. So earnings uh, on the endowment, new contributions, any appropriations or approved transfers out of the endowment. This footnote can tend to be really a couple pages of pages long um, for organizations once it's all said and done. There's a fair amount of written disclosures uh, required as well. Um, but provides more information to a reader on how the organization manages their endowment. And as a board member or a management team where you work with or in an organization that has an endowment, you know, things to consider would be, do you, do you rely heavily on the distributions from the endowment to support the organization? Do you have a goal to grow the endowment to a certain threshold? And if so, you know, what is that goal and what are you doing to, to get there? And as I mentioned, if you have dollars invested in an endowment, you should have specific investment policies and spending policies that help guide the decision making um, as it relates to management of the endowment. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Ksenia to cover revenues and expense reporting. All right. Well, thank you, Maria. And uh, as Maria mentioned, I'm going to discuss revenue and expense reporting for not-for-profit organizations. And for those board members coming in from a corporate side, some of the revenue sources of the not-for-profit might be unique. They might not be um, difficult to understand, but the accounting for some of them could be more complex, and we're going to touch base um, on those. So on the next slide, we discuss the common sources of revenue for the not-for-profit. So those uh, 
different types of not-for-profits operate different business models. If, uh, for example, you're coming in from a foundation and the foundation might have contributions and grants, maybe a special event as your main sources of revenue. If you're an operating not-for-profit, you're a museum, a performing arts organization, um, a school, you might have a variety of other sources of revenue, such as fee-for-service. You might have a gift shop where you sell goods and uh, for the benefit of your constituents. If you have large investments or endowment portfolios, you might also rely fairly heavily on investment returns in that particular scenario. So talking about contributions, um, contributions, and that would be on the next slide, uh, we have a few uh, areas that I wanted to touch on. Contributions are non-exchange transactions. So those of transactions that actually come to your organization without having an organization to perform in return. So they could come in various uh, types where it could be cash, promises to give, we'll touch on those a little bit later, investments. You might also experience uh, contributions from fixed assets, for example, or in-kind contributions of professional services. Uh, you could receive contributions of alternative investments, partnership interests, the list kind of goes on. The um, conditional contributions is another area that's unique to not-for-profits as a subset of contributions, but these contributions have a very specific condition attached to this revenue stream where the revenue is not recognizable in your set of financial statements until you actually meet that condition. And what I mean by that, you probably most common is a matching contribution during a large capital campaign where a donor places a condition on your contribution that the organization has to match certain dollar amount uh, of that contribution to be able to recognize it. For example, a donor might give you a million dollars towards uh, a capital campaign, but with a condition to raise an additional million dollars uh, prior to them either releasing funds or if the funds already uh, come into your organization as cash, they should be recognized as a liability uh, before all of the conditions are met. On the promises to give, that's also a unique area under contributions, and that is a contribution payable in the future. So in the for-profit world, uh, you would have a receivable on your books for sale of your services. For promises to give, that slightly different type of receivable. It's a contribution that will be payable in the future over sometimes multiple years. And the of difficulty here is that promises to give are to be recognized and recorded when the unconditional promise uh, is made. So in the year that you receive that million dollars for your capital campaign, entire revenue is recognized up front. But the promise to give could be payable over five years. So it could create some challenges in comparability of your financial statements because your financial statements for any single year could look a lot higher because of that uh, multi-year promise to give that was received by your organization. And one other thing to mention here is that intentions to give are not recordable. Your contributions have to be irrevocable before you can uh, record it in your financials. And what I mean by that is the board and management really need to pay attention to the agreements because sometimes you might receive a letter from of a donor saying that they intend to give, but they could always pull this intention back and so that revenue would not be recognizable. So reading the agreements uh, is key when recognizing this revenue. So the next slide will talk about special events. And the special events are also unique to your organization. They represent fundraising dinners, benefit concerts, auctions, and so forth. You're probably most familiar with things like galas. And not-for-profit uh, organizations are required to track the uh, access of value that the attendee receives as a contribution. And what that means is 
many of you and us probably have attended galas where a ticket costs $150, but the organization actually of, has to provide the that donor, the ticket holder, with an information of how much of that ticket is actually deductible on their personal contribution of on your personal tax return as a contribution, because there are items called cost of direct benefits to donors, or sometimes referred to as night of event expenses, where the donor actually receives value in return. So it's the food that they're technically purchasing with that ticket. It's the entertainment. And the organization is required to value those and provide that value back to uh, the donor so that the donor can assess what is their contribution to be deductible on the tax return. The bottom of this slide shows you the presentation that's required for special events that are major and recurring for your organization. So if you have an annual gala that repeats itself and it is a major event for your organization, this would be the presentation in your uh, statement of activities where you have to break out gross special events revenue and then net it with the cost of direct benefit to donors. So things to consider when thinking of revenue and revenue presentation and some of the metrics that your organization might like to share with the board members and keep track of. For example, percentage of contributed support versus the earned revenue. This wouldn't necessarily apply to foundations that rely almost 100% on contributed support, but for those operating not-for-profits that actually have earned revenue, uh, you do probably want to know, well, what is the percentage? What's the breakout point? How much of contributed support do we need to receive in any given year to uh, actually earn some surplus and earn some profit? And I'm gonna have a few slides later on towards the end of the presentation on telling your story where this particular bullet point will become even uh, more important. Then concentrations of revenue from any single source. Are you tracking your concentrations, whether it's from donor or a certain grantor? And how are you uh, continuing to foster that relationship? And what is the risk if that particular donor that represents perhaps 30, 40% of your total contribution revenue from the year, if they have a change of heart and uh, spend their dollars elsewhere? Very important to keep, keep donor tracking software so you could see the trends of new donors coming in, donors that are dropping off perhaps, So, but also keeping track of the concentrations. I've mentioned very briefly in-kind contributions. Those contributions that come in in the form of donated professional services, goods or materials, and how are those recorded? Uh, and if they are recorded, if they actually meet the recognition criteria under GAP, are you placing reliance on those professional services? So for example, do you have a board member uh, that provides legal services that are important to your organization and actually constitute a material amount? And if that board member's term ends in three years and you have to replace those legal services with out outside consulting, how much is that going to cost for, uh, your organization? And how can you plan for that replacement, perhaps with um, additions of board members uh, to your board long term who can provide those services? And then when you're looking at promises to give, this uh, talks a little bit about going back to the statement of financial position, but also on the statement of activities. Sometimes you could see if these promises to give are being written off as losses. Are they being collected? And it's not just a simple comparison between uh, promises to give from one year to the next to see if they're decreasing, but paying attention to the statement of activities to see if there are any large material losses uh, on your promises to give that are uh, historically not being collected. So let's talk about the expense reporting a little bit for your uh, not-for-profit. And uh, Maria mentioned already that not-for-profits are now required to show the uh, presentation of your expenses by different categories. 
The next slide actually has an example of the statement of functional expenses. There was a new standard issued that changed the reporting for net assets in the last couple of years. But what that standard also did is now requiring not-for-profits to present the information of natural categories of your expenses. So uh, items that you see on the left-hand side, side of the slide, so your salaries, your advertising, office expenses, and so forth, but also break out these natural categories by at least three columns, program services management and general fundraising and development. Because of, of the importance of this information and the allocations needed uh, to properly put together this statement, uh, the organizations use various allocation methods and so forth that are very important. As far as the presentation of these natural categories of expenses, um, they more or less mirror the 990. The 990 has required you to present a statement of functional expenses for a long time. Uh, FASB and GAP are now catching up because two of these documents, your of financial statements and the 990, are very closely tied and uh, present the full picture of the, your organization. This information is not required to be presented as a separate statement. A lot of not-for-profits have chosen to do so. The information can also be presented in the footnotes. Or on the next slide, there is an example of a smaller not-for-profit presenting the breakout straight on the face of the statement of activities under the expense category, but breaking it out between grant activities, management in general. One thing to point out here, uh, yes, this presentation uh, actually is considered applicable under GAAP. I think one maybe shortfall of this presentation is you would have to calculate on your own what is the total depreciation of the organization? What are the total occupancy costs? Because there are no subtotals on this statement. So things to consider when discussing of expenses are what's the percentage of functional expenses, meaning uh, what is the total percentage of your program expenses as, uh, oh, sorry, as a percentage of total expenses. And some watchdog organizations of like GuideStar actually calculate these percentages for you, but it is also a very important metric internally to see how are different allocations changing these percentages. Then another metric that you could keep track of is program revenue versus program expenses. Are you able to cover all of your programmatic expenditures just with program revenue? For example, tuition versus educational expenses or admissions versus your program expenses of running a museum. Another metric that we often see is contributions and special events revenue as compared to fundraising expenses. What's the return on investment in your development department? Are they able to uh, solicit enough contributions to cover fundraising costs and hopefully uh, have additional contributions that are uh, unrestricted or restricted to help the organization? A couple other points here on the slide I'm not going to spend as much time on, but commitments. You could see if you have lease payments or interest expense from your statement of functional expenses and question whether or not there are long term commitments that your organization uh, need to comply with. And then on the liquidity, for example, you could calculate what is the monthly churn of your expenses. So if you're if you are a $12 million organization and your typical expenses run at a million dollars, well, of how much cash do you have on hand to cover those expenses? So statement of functional expenses becomes um, a very interesting statement to do. You could do a lot of calculations and it could help you make some strategic decisions and also look at trends. So talking about trends, I'm gonna turn it over back to Maria, who's gonna jump into some of the non-financial key metrics and benchmarking. Thank you. Thanks, Ksenia. So primarily what we've talked through so far are financial statement and financial related metrics um, and indicators, but there are also a lot of key non-financial metrics that are important to keep in mind 
you know, when serving on a nonprofit board or working within a nonprofit organization. So this slide, we've included just a few of those non-financial metrics. The first being, you know, understanding your donors or your stakeholders. Who are they? How often are you staying in front of your donors? Do you do anything to understand donor satisfaction? Um, do you track how many of your donors are recurring donors versus new donors that you may have? And is engaging and interacting with those different groups the same? or is it different? Um, from a board engagement standpoint, does, does the board have a clear understanding of what the mission of the organization is and are they engaged in that mission? Do they have a clear understanding of, of what the expectation is of them as a board member? I know that the board that I sit on in an onboarding uh, of new board members, there's a, there's a document that everyone receives uh, that highlights and details out board expectations. So not everyone may be able to give financially to the organization as some boards often do have some sort of financial giving expectation, but maybe a board member's contributions are better valued in time and, and other specific knowledge. Um, do you have specific expectations about meeting attendance requirements? You know, with a lot of meetings now happening virtually, you know, most boards I would expect should be seeing an increase in numbers attending their meetings. But as we all know with Zoom meetings, are you encouraging active participation to ensure full engagement by the board? You know, are board members involved in committees? Are they attending events? So a lot of, a lot of different things to think about there as it relates to board engagement. If your organization has employees or independent contractors, you know, what is their overall job satisfaction and retention? If you're experiencing high unexpected turnover in roles, you know, is that something that needs to be addressed? And as it relates to volunteers, a lot of organizations depend very much on the time and effort of, of their volunteers. So are you able to continue to offer those volunteer opportunities that keep bringing you, those volunteers back year after year? Do you talk to your volunteers on their overall volunteer experience and ask for their feedback? Oftentimes engaged volunteers will also uh, contribute a financial donation. And the last thing on here is service area results or specific program results. You know, do you have specific program goals and are you able to track those goals to be able to share them back with the public, whether that's number of members, number of students or children being served, number of hours dedicated to a specific program area. This really will vary from organization to organization, but always good to think about what are those metrics that will help the public and your stakeholders understand the impact that your organization's having beyond the financial statement numbers. So in this next, last section, we're going to touch on some ideas on how to use these nonprofit financial statements beyond just required annual reporting. So two ways in which you can do so is, is using them for strategic decision-making and storytelling. First with strategic decision-making, you know, once you understand the key areas of nonprofit financial and non-financial reporting, boards and management can more cohesively work together to perform effective due diligence when it's needed, you know, about where the organization has been and where the organization may be going in the future. And that all is gonna help make well-informed strategic decisions. And also you'll be able to present financial and non-financial information, both internally and externally in a way that tells the most compelling story to your readers. So talking a little bit more in depth on the strategic decision-making first, as I mentioned earlier, when talking about non-financial metrics, it's important to ensure that your board has a clear understanding of what the organization's mission, values, and purpose are. If each board member were you know, to get stuck in an elevator with someone, would they tell a similar story about who the organization is and what your mission is? You know, having an annual or biannual board retreat or strategic planning session can help re-engage a board, you know, bring everyone on the same page and ensure everyone is moving in the same direction. It's also always important to be evaluating the makeup of your board. What is the board composition and do you have any specific needs or holes to fill? You know, most nonprofit organizations do lean on their boards for specific skill sets from time to time. So it's important to ensure that you have the right people on your board to step up when those needs arise. 
you know, most board members have an expectation to serve on at least one committee of the board. It's always a good idea to ensure that you have the right individuals on the right committees and reevaluating from time to time, you know, if the current committees in place are the right committees. Are you moving into a capital campaign um, where a development committee would be beneficial? If you're in a stage where you need to revise your strategic plan, would a strategic planning committee benefit your organization? You know, the topic of diversity and inclusion has always been an important one, but now I think more than ever, there is a specific, this is a specific topic that many organizations are focusing on. And, and in order to really advance initiatives surrounding this area, would, you know, a separate diversity and inclusion committee help move that forward in a more timely manner? The next area on here is benchmarking. Data can always help you in that strategic decision-making process. There are a lot of different tools out there that you can utilize to help benchmark your organization against others. You know, seeing trends in your financial da data and, and monitoring program performance is helpful. Much of this could be done manually, but time and effort may be more costly than utilizing an outside resource to help with that as a tool. A lot of ERP systems today have built-in benchmarking and trending capabilities that can be very helpful as well. So I'll share some examples uh, on this topic here shortly. And then last but not least, defining specific goals and measurements that will help reflect progress or success in what you hope to accomplish are a key aspect of strategic decision-making as well. So I have some examples to share of what financial benchmarking may look like. These are pretty high level, but uh, I'm sure many or most of you have heard of GuideStar. Ksenia had referenced that a little earlier, but these examples come specifically from a GuideStar financial trends analysis report. Um, you can put in particular entities, names, EINs, and these benchmarking reports are produced. It is important to know that it is based on historical 990 data. So the information might be a year old or more, but it is helpful to see historical trends for different areas or activities within the organization. You know, these examples specifically rate, relate to revenue composition and expense comp composition or concentration that Ksenia had referred to. Uh, but questions to think about here are whether your revenue or expense mixes, do they remain steady over time? You know, major shifts in revenue composition may be indicative of a shift in your business model. Um, revenue diversification can be very beneficial um, to nonprofits. So, you know, you're not having all your eggs in one basket, but it's also good to think about, you know, what is the right number of revenue streams that make sense for your organization? Um, because there may, it might be more viable to have less options than more. On the net asset trends, which is at the bottom, um, GuideStar was still utilizing the old three net asset category that I described here, uh, but it gives you that breakdown between those three net asset categories. You know, if you're running a capital campaign in a previous year, you might see a spike in that temporarily restricted net asset category, but then, uh, you know, maybe it comes down over time as those assets are released from restriction and that would be, you know, shown in a trending graph like this. It's also always good to look at how this one trends in total, so total net assets, because even with fluctuation from year to year within that restricted or uh, unrestricted area, um, that net assets without donor restriction typically reflects what truly is available to support the operation. So understanding how much of your unrestricted funds are truly liquid rather than invested in property and equipment can really depict a more comprehensive view of, of kind of your organization's financial safety net or available net worth. A few more financial trending or benchmarking examples available through that GuideStar report. Look at profitability and year over year surpluses or, or deficits. Um, looking at it with depreciation and without depreciation expense factored in. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, breaking even every year is typically not enough as nonprofits really need a surplus to survive and grow. So seeing a trending surplus over time is a key indicator of financial health and consistent or growing deficits can be a sign of concern. But it's also important to discuss, you know, how the organization is going to manage regular surpluses, you know, whether that's in the anticipation of future challenges or opportunities. 
you know, there are times when deficits are un, you know, unavoidable. 2020 is probably one of those years that a lot of organizations are finding themselves there, you know, with economic downturns and everything going on currently, but also in times when there is a strategic plan with the expectation that future revenues will be coming. You know, it's a period of change or growth. And in either case, you know, dialogue about that will help provide that context. Um, there was a new requirement in recent years related to liquidity. Ksenia had mentioned that. Um, so this chart on the bottom with months of liquidity is one um, picture of that showing um, trending months of cash on hand um, and cash and investments on hand. This example specifically shows consistency. Um, if your organization portrayed more volatility here, you know, this may be something that you would want to place attention on and, and how to bring that into a more stable trend. This is an example of some non-financial programmatic indicators. As I mentioned, you know, many ERP systems today allow you the ability to build in the capability to track specific program related numbers. In this example, this is a school who is looking to track the number of students they are interacting with, how many of these students are interacted with by specific program areas, and what level of influence are these interactions having on these students. Again, just one example of some non-financial program indicators that help track successes and showcase impact that programs are having. The last uh, benchmarking example I have here, again, from that GuideStar report, but this kind of takes it a step further and tracks against peer organizations. So the numbers across the top, one, two, three, four, five, you know, they represent five different organizations that you can identify um, when building this analysis and then provides a number of comparison, <clears throat> comparison areas. So this example here specifically shows revenue concentration and, and liquidity examples you know, really allowing you to see how your organization lines up with others um, that you've identified when it comes to revenue sources or months of cash on hand. And again, this information is coming from 990 data and, and some organizations present things a little different within their 990. So it's always keeping that in mind as you're reviewing this type of information. But every organization really is different, is going to have different key performance indicators that they may wanna track and see and trend over time. Um, so what, what we've shared with you here really is kind of just a few high level examples of, of how you may wanna accomplish that. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Ksenia to talk a little bit more about the telling your story. All right, thanks Maria. And I'm going to take probably the rest of the time of the presentation to talk about various components of your financial statements and your notes where uh, using a different approach uh, could actually really quite change your story and how your users of your financials could look at the, uh, the statements themselves and come up with um, a very different perspective of your organization. Number one thing is, as I mentioned before, the Form 990 and your financial statements do represent two public documents and of using them as your marketing tools to the best advantage of your organization is key and reviewing those side by side to make sure that the information that's being presented throughout both documents is consistent. There's also quite a bit of flexibility within each financial statement and your footnotes on presentation. We have quite a few examples to show you how that flexibility could be accomplished on each of the statements uh, and going forward. Um, on the one thing to note is also single year versus comparative financial statement presentation. In any given year, you have a choice as an organization how much financial information are you presenting to your users. The minimum required would be to present a single year uh, financial statements. Sometimes if you change your year end, that particular presentation could encompass, for example, 18 months of presentation. You could also present two full sets of comparative presentation where you have two years side by side and full two years of notes. What we're seeing a lot in practice and I think a lot of not-for-profits are choosing this particular presentation is a comparative presentation of financial statements where the actual 
financial statements like balance sheet, statement of cash flows, your statement of activities are presented using a comparative information, but the footnotes are only presenting a single year picture of your organization. And then a couple other things, we've talked about liquidity quite a, quite a bit and whether it's positive or negative, uh, we will show you some examples on how to make a difference in the actual of uh, decision making for your donors and funders. And then I think nowadays we can't really finish a presentation without discussion of COVID and how that particular footnote is changing the financial statements to talk about the impact of the pandemic and how the organization has um, changed their operations to combat of the actual results. So let's talk about on the next page, I'm going to discuss presentation options. And for the statement of financial position, for example, you could present classified versus non-classified balance sheet. And what I mean by those terms is classified balance sheet is a presentation of assets and liabilities broken out between current and non-current. Not-for-profit actually are not required to do so. And in practice, we see a lot of not-for-profits simply ordering their assets and liabilities in the order of liquidity. So starting with cash and ending with permanent endowment where corpus really cannot be touched and needs to be maintained in perpetuity. The one presentation that could change on the statement of financial position, as Maria talked about, is the presentation of your net assets. Do you want to show breakout of what are uh, net assets available for general expenditures? What are the net assets that are designated by the board? For example, if your organization has a fairly significant net asset balance, it might be advisable to break it down so that your funders are not looking at that number and uh, creating a picture in their head that they might not need to fund your organization because your net asset balance is so solid. It is possible to create a slightly different presentation by breaking out various restrictions on your net assets and board designations and those net assets invested in property, plant and equipment to come up with an undesignated balance that is a lot less than your total telling the story that a lot of your net assets are invested in various purposes and you still need those funding dollars. On the statement of activities, you have a lot of flexibility. There are no real order of the different components that's required. And I'm gonna show you a few examples of that and discuss the operating and non-operating measures. As I mentioned before, the statement of functional expenses is not a required statement. That information could be presented in the footnotes. But one thing to point out on the statement of functional expenses is how many programs do you wish to break out in that program category? How many specific cost centers does your organization keep track of? Is there um, a story you want to tell through that statement of functional expenses of how you manage your programs and where do the dollars go? On the statement of cash flows, there's also a different type of presentations that you could elect. And there's two methods, direct versus indirect, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And footnotes, footnotes is where you really tell your story. And we do focus a lot on the actual statements because that's the first part of your financial statements that people see but footnotes should not be forgotten because that's where a lot of your programmatic story could come to light. So let's look at the statement of activities and focus on a couple of examples. This particular example, and I hope you could see all these numbers. Uh, they are also these slides uh, have been uh, made available to you and you could look at it um, on your own time. But this particular presentation is called uh, a statement of activities without an operating measure. And what that means is that uh, the presentation here lists all of your revenue support and gains at the top of the statement, followed by all of your expenses coming to the end uh, of the net income for the year or change in net assets. This story of these financial st statements would tell me that you are a $10 million 
organization with an annual budget where a majority of your revenue comes from performance revenue, some courses, and follows by contributions and grants. So this particular statement and this presentation uh, shows the reader the size of your organization, more so maybe than how you actually manage your operations. On the next slide, it's the identical organization with identical numbers, but regrouped slightly differently. This particular statement shows an operating measure, meaning that your operating revenue and your operating expenses are presented first to come to that middle uh, of the page number, negative $1.5 million loss, that shows your readers that uh, maybe this is of you know a slightly larger loss than in the previous years, but if you were to to see a comparative presentation for this organization, you will also see that organization actually experiences losses on a consistent basis from operations because it is so expensive to put on uh, performances and run education programs that an organization heavily relies on contributions, grants, their special events, and also distributions from their endowment to create net investment return. So this particular story, even though it is of the same organization, can be presented differently to your donors to discuss the need of contributions to cover those um, operating losses that you sustain as part of uh, carrying out your mission and helping out the community. And then another presentation I wanted to, uh, pre to show you is a very different statement of activities. Uh, this particular statement of activities is actually that of a private foundation. And this statement of activities shows up as their first statement. The balance sheet they present is a second statement because the key thing here that the organization is trying to show you is that they, the impact that they have on the community with the grants that they award on an annual basis. So they actually start with expenditures followed by uh, revenue. So as I mentioned, there is no particular order to the statements. You don't have to present balance sheet first, um, uh, then income statement second, and so forth. Um, you also don't have to present revenue first and expenses second. So in this particular uh, statement of activities, you could see that the organization has a significant impact on the local community with $35 million of grants, and it's the first number you see in these financial statements. So they also do not present a statement of functional expenses. We had a, an example uh, previously where the natural expense categories of salaries, professional services, occupancy is shown both under grant making costs and your GNA. They do not have fundraising expenses to break out because they're a private foundation and majority of the contributions come from the family. And so the revenue section of, you know, is not as important here as the impact on the community. So let's, let's talk about a statement of cash flows. On the statement of cash flows, you also have an option of presenting your operating activities in two different ways. The top example here is more of a mathematical exercise. This is easier for the CPAs to prepare. A lot of uh, not-for-profits choose this particular presentation, but what it shows you is the change in net assets as the top line, and then the reconciliation of your balance sheet accounts of how you arrive at the net cash from operating activities. Again, exactly same uh, bottom line in both examples, but the uh, second example shows you a direct method of cash flows that actually FASB of uh, wanted to make direct method a requirement for all not-for-profit organizations in the country. They got a little bit of a pushback. And so both methods are acceptable under GAP. But you could see how the second example could be more useful to your readers to actually see what operating cash do we receive from tuition payments, contributions? How much do we pay our employees uh, for salaries, benefits, and taxes? And how much do we pay our vendors? So again, uh, same impact on the operating activities, bottom line, but a very different story.
So that's a, uh, what I wanted to cover on the actual statements. The next slide goes into footnotes. Uh, we've mentioned liquidity multiple times, but it was a new uh, footnote disclosure requirement for all not-for-profits in the country. And again, two examples, similar numbers, very different presentation. The top portion shows you all financial assets of your organization. So you won't see fixed assets here. You won't see prepaid expenses. So it's not a, a complete presentation of your balance sheet or statement of financial position. But these are assets appearing on your balance sheet that are financial assets in nature. And those assets are both restricted and unrestricted. And then the second portion of the first table starts taking out uh, those financial assets that are unavailable for general expenditures within one year. So this organization has a board designated reserve. They have some restrictions placed on their net assets by donors, uh, such as endowment, capital improvements, scholarships, and so forth. And so this presentation actually arrives at total liquidity of your organization uh, showing financial assets available to meet cash needs within the next 12 months. The bottom presentation is a more condensed version where of if you were to actually do the math behind these numbers, you would see that cash and cash equivalents available to meet your expenditures in the next 12 months is 3.8 million. Operating investments, none of them were restricted, so the entire amount is being carried forward. Uh, accounts receivable. And the difference here is endowment spending rate distribution. So this number is actually a budgeted distribution that you are relying on based on the spending rate formula from your endowment. So that number is the only forward-looking number in your set of liquidity disclosures. And just to finish up fairly quickly here, liquidity disclosures also require a policy statement. And again, two examples for you to use. The top one is a very condensed uh, minimal requirements that you need to discuss how you manage your liquidity. Most organizations uh, go probably with more of a middle ground disclosure. Uh, we have some that disclosure requirements are a page, a page and a half. In this particular scenario, the organization is discussing their board designated endowments and how those are available for operations if needed. The management also opened a line of credit to help with their liquidity. So a little bit more information there. And then to finish off the presentation, uh, and we'll take questions, we'll actually answer questions offline and reach out to each individual specifically. We have a few there, uh, but I wanted to talk about COVID impact. And I know we have a lot of uh, different organizations on of this webcast, and COVID has impacted different organizations in very different ways. For some of them, unfortunately, some not-for-profits are on the brink of bankruptcy. Some have significant liquidity issues, performing arts organizations that have gone completely dark and there's so much uncertainty when the performing venues will reopen throughout the country. So a lot of those considerations need to make it into your financial statements and the footnotes to tell the reader what is what are some of the steps you're taking to combat the impact of COVID? So this first um, footnote here is just an example of more of a negative impact on the organization, what organization is doing by receiving funding under Paycheck Protection Program, having some cost-cutting measures, reducing performances, also obviously to furlough staff and so forth. On the other page, though, I wanted to finish this presentation with something positive for all of us to take away that there are multiple not-for-profits that actually have seen uh, an outpouring of the community of the support to combat COVID. And we have multiple organizations where contributions are actually at unprecedented historic levels. And in that particular case, uh, it is very important to showcase what is the organization going to do with that outpouring of the support and not how they're helping the community and those around them.
so that's that's what I wanted to leave you with. And uh, we're right at the top of the hour. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll get to Q&A and uh, give you a call or answer via email. Thank you so much for joining us today and hope this was helpful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And like Kasinia said, we will pull the report of all your questions and get back to you via email. And your CPE certificate, as long as you met all of the criteria, will be emailed out within 10 to 14 days after this webinar. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Kasinia. Have a good day, guys.